And start this very important session entitled Is it real development if inequalities increase? This is a very important session as far as contents are concerned because we say this year the cards to say I, but we also want an I that is well aware of the concrete and tangible economic possibilities, but also because we have some world international experts in this field. We have the great honor to have Jean-Paul VDC, a world-renowned economist and one of the most important experts about inequalities. So we thank him very much for honoring us with his presence. He came for us here to Rimini from Paris. The other world level economist that we have is uh, Stefano Zamagni, the president of the Pontifical Academy for Social Sciences, another friend of the meeting and uh, is here back and he has the most important position at Vatican level when it comes to economic issues. So thank you very much. Uh, Stefano for joining us. And then we have uh, another guest to complete this uh, extremely important panel. We have Franco Gallo, the president of Treccani, former president of the Constitutional Court, member of the Accademia dei Lincei, so one of the most important experts when it comes to Italian law and also specialist in these topics, so we thank you very much for your participation. This uh, session is going to be started with a short introduction, and then I will ask some questions to our guests. At the meeting, we often say that a development resulting uh, from the globalization and after it, uh, well, generated an increase in inequalities. But maybe this is not just a matter of welfare and redistribution, because the very same development model is at stake, our income generating model more generally. Poor countries reduced the gap with respect to richer countries, but inside countries, the differences have increased in the first, second, and third world. 2,150 extra rich people own goods and wealth corresponding to what 4.6 billion people just have in the world and less than one percent uh, and less than one percent of the richness of the world is so distributed in the rest of the world so welfare state uh, should be better organized but some say that increasing inequalities are the leading cause of the possible decay of some countries well, we are talking right now about uh, the crisis of uh, Western democracies. I wonder whether this has 
anything to do with that. So what are inequalities about? Uh, is that development if there are inequalities? And again, I'm just uh, sharing some ideas. So unemployment and uh, income inequalities, Maurice Sandel, an economist said that those left behind by so many years of globalization and very inequalities are suffering not just for wage stagnation, but they also suffer because the society they live in uh, seem not to need them anymore in terms of competences and skills. So one of the big myths of the capital market is that if you sort of can work, you can always improve. So the elites that were ruling the globalization have not been able to manage inequalities, but also they have not understood the detrimental effect on dignity of people. Then let's talk about relational inequalities. When we talk about inequalities, we just think about uh, income uh, inequalities. Angus Deaton, Nobel Prize winner for uh, economics, uh, talked about relational differences and he said, when individuals are not equally treated in society, when some groups are assigned a greater value and others are not given full rights when it comes to participation, that means that there are citizen A and citizens B. And another French sociologist said that workers ask to be heard and acknowledged and respected because without that you cannot have dignity, you just survive. So if these things are not taken seriously, you can even get a very good wage but still suffer from your working condition. Then you have a third level of inequalities and we saw that during the remote schooling is about technological development because the value and worth of a companies uh, is uh, growingly more and more intangible. So the intangible side of things uh, is uh, due to the fact that uh, there is always a bigger digital divide. If we have a look at the differences between higher income and lower income people, it is clear that education plays a key role. So the concentration of uh, material goods becomes like a sign and a flag when it comes to defining certain conditions. So education is uh, reserved to a limited number of people. Let's uh, say, let's make an Italian example. According to Invasi data, remote schooling had a strong impact on the poorest students. So 60% of poorer students was heavily affected. So if you are wealthier and you have the tools to connect, you can still have access to teaching and schooling. If not, you're left behind. So that means that there is a crisis in development model. It has to do not just with the redistribution, but also with the very same development model. And this is also partially due to financial liberalism. So I'm going to ask our guests my first question. And I'm going to ask a, a question to the two economists and another one to the law expert. So which are the most evident inequalities that you see today at world level and which are the consequences on life of the people, economy and society? So we thank Professor Fitusi once again and I give him the floor straight away. Thank you. You already said everything. What is it left? I don't have much to add. 
I have the courage to say I in Italian and I hope that your ears won't suffer too much from my Italian. So your ears are also courageous. Thank you in advance for your comprehension. Is it pos it's possible to study inequalities from different vantage points? For instance, you emphasized the causes of inequalities, so technology, globalization, and so on and so forth. I'll try to highlight another aspect. And in particular, I refer to the specific situation today in the world. If I look at the world, first of all, I see a reduction of inequalities between in countries and then I see a great increase of inequalities inside countries, and then I see a strong distance from democracy. Why is it so? The first phenomenon that is the reduction of inequalities between and among countries means that non-democratic countries are able to grow much, much more than democratic countries and than northern countries. So democracy, when we measure the economic performance of the system, does not seem to be an advantage for growth any longer. Secondly, the fact that in democratic regimes there is an internal growth of uh, inequalities, and I'll make a very self-evident example that has to do with uh, space uh, missions when people have problems in paying for fuel. Symbolically, this is a pretty strong example that tells you a lot. So this kind of situation means that we have neglected a large part of the inequalities issues democracy loses then its legitimacy. I'm sorry because maybe I'm competing with President Gallo with what I'm saying. And a judge of the Supreme Court of the US used to say, So we can have democracy as a regime, or we can have the money concentrated in very few hands, but we cannot have both. So he wanted to say that if money is concentrated in a few hands, that means that the power of some specific categories of citizens will be stronger and bigger than that of other categories. And this violates one of the basic principles of the system we live in. 
is the principle of uh, universal suffrage. Let's imagine some uh, private uh, heads of state that own TV networks and magazines and uh, media and companies. Well, they certainly have a much bigger power as you and me. And so they can change, for instance, the result of the universal suffrage because of their influence. So our system then seems to lose its uh, underlying sort of basic uh, principles. So one vote for each one because the equality principle goes hand in hand with the inequality principle. Our system can survive if uh, a compromise is found between uh, these two principles, uh, quality, equality and inequality. But our system is not able any longer to find uh, a compromise between two, these two principles, uh, equality and inequality. So this is not by accident if uh, today democracy is not the preferred regime of people any longer. Nationalism, populism, the so-called liberal democracy grow if extremist parties grow and uh, we had uh, an example today in the session with the leaders of the political parties and uh, there are at least uh, two uh, leaders, there were two leaders uh, representing two extremist parties if I'm not wrong and so that means that uh, democracy is in danger. From my point of view as economist, well, democracy is always the most precious good because democracy means freedom and freedom must uh, be political and economic. So if you have just the economic freedom, it's not real freedom. I don't know if I answered your first question. Oh yes, you did, Professor. Thank you very much. You were very clear. Now the floor goes to Stefano. Thank you, Giorgio. First of all, I want to congratulate the meeting on the choice of these uh, title session. So is it development if inequalities grow? So the world uh, development is very important because usually when you have uh, specific letters or prefixes, uh, in uh, Italian and in Latin, you deny a word. So sviluppo in Italian has an S. And usually the S means uh, uh, sort of uh, neutralization of something. So sviluppo means uh, sort of uh, removing a tangle, so untangling. What are we talking about? So sviluppo development is about the growth of the GDP but then there are other two things to be reminded, the social relational dimension of development and the spiritual dimension of development. Human development is so when these three dimensions are harmoniously in balance. 
so they balance themselves mutually. So that's the main issue. When inequalities grow, and this is the case in all our countries, especially in the Western world, and this is what has happened over the last 40 years. So then the growth increases, and as a matter of fact, the global GDP is on the rise. There is no decrease in that sense, but the rise of inequalities seems to go to the detriment of the other two dimensions, the social, relational, and uh, the spiritual, because human beings need to need to, to eat, but they also need to establish relations. That's why that uh, that's why we say the courage to say I, because courage as a word comes from heart, cuore. So to have courage, you need passion and desire. Rationality is not enough. That's why inequalities as a topic acquire a new meaning with respect to previous generations. In the past, inequalities were connected to poverty, but poverty was one thing and inequalities were considered as different. For instance, I can be a decent person and not be poor and maybe have a decent standard of life. But if the distance separating me from other social groups tends to endemically increase, so that means in a systematic way, it goes without saying that the relational dimension, the so-called relational goods, will be lacking. So I won't be able to be happy. And the same applies to the spiritual dimension. This is why, in my opinion, is it very it is very important to fix things because too often we uh, sort of uh, make confusion and we mix up the fight against uh, poverty with the fight against uh, inequalities because i mean uh, we have always heard about uh, the fact of uh, supporting uh, the poorest categories and so on but Inequalities are a more recent topic. So the category to which Jean-Paul and I belong, so that is the economist uh, uh, category, well, have to acknowledge something because until some years ago, even if there are uh, exceptions always in any scientific community, I've always considered inequalities as uh, a topic to be assigned uh, to political experts or sociologists, so we've always been told as economists, you have to deal with growth, so the first dimension. And then when it comes to the uh, growth increase, so, and how this cake is going to be shared among those that made it, well, this is something that we're going to leave to political experts, policymakers, uh, or other kinds of uh, professionals. So my question is, why uh, is this underestimation so common? And why is it so that uh, more recently economists have uh, taken the floor much more to talk about uh, inequalities? And I have the impression that from 2010 until now, at international level, 28 books have been published and let's put aside uh, essays uh, and uh, articles that have been specifically devoted to inequalities as a topic. Why is it so? Why is it that economists and the world keep um, dealing with that more and more of these topics? First of all, because they understood that when inequalities increase, uh, they jeopardize sustainability. This is something that is not very much heard around. So the connection between the increase in inequalities and sustainability. Because when inequality, when certain thresholds are overcome, you have a, a specific level of uh, revenue that change and Ricardo, famous economist of the past, already said that 
when the income, so the rent increases, so there is a consequence on other elements. And there are consequences, so on other economic factors. So the increase in inequalities is a sign that the share of yield of income on the GDP so is changing. We have a share of 32%. That means that one third of what we produce goes into, I mean, uh, uh, income that does not generate other value. So it's not generative. So it doesn't generate anymore. So businesses and capital generate income. But income does not generate income. So when inequalities increase, you go towards plutocracy. This is another Greek word. So kratos means power and Pluto means richness, prosperity. And Aristotle already understood that plutocracy is the main enemy of democracy because democracy means power to the people. So it used to say, if you want to keep democracy, you need to avoid, we could say today, that the economic power concentrates in very few hands. But instead, as uh, Giorgio Vitadini in his opening remarks said, this is what is happening. I'm not going to repeat uh, the, the, the figures because they are well known. So those who really care for democracy cannot pretend uh, I mean, not to see the, what is happening with the increase of inequalities. The third uh, important factor is that inequalities increase is one of the leading factors of financial instability. The big uh, economic and financial crisis of 2007-2008 was provoked by the increase in inequalities among the others, because otherwise that crisis had nothing to do with the natural devastating causes. Have you ever thought about that? Today, we are really faced with a sort of bifurcation, because on the one hand, there are those who think to somehow be contempt with the fight against poverty, also in political terms. So that seems to be enough because poverty levels are going down at world level. We had the pandemic event that somehow worsened the situation, but we also know that up until 2019, the poorest people, according to the criteria established by the UN were 800 million up until three years ago, there were 2.5 billion. So we certainly need not to stop our fight against poverty, but we cannot mix up the two things, especially as, especially if, sorry, if I said in the beginning, we really want to carry out an integral full human development. And I want to end with a sentence that maybe was not considered enough by Pope Francis. He used it for the first time in 2014, Evangelii Gaudium, and then he sort of repeated that in the Fratres Omnes, Brothers All, last year. He said, inequality is the origin of social evil. He doesn't say poverty because Pope Francis understands things pretty well. And he says uh, inequality is the main source of social evil. And social evil means uh, the loss of democracy, therefore of freedom, and most of all, the loss of the in interpersonal relations, so what is called the social capital. Social capital is nothing but the network of trust relations between and among the people living in a certain context. When trust, uh, let's say, relations are lacking, there's nothing to do, and uh, 
without any trust relations, you cannot fulfill that need that we all have that is the need for happiness. Professor Fitoussi uh, and uh, uh, Mrs. Zamani uh, have explained to us uh, how, uh, from an economic perspective, uh, inequalities uh, mean uh, um, jeopardizing the life of uh, people. Then uh, we have the legal perspective. On top of all, now I would ask Professor Gallo uh, something different. What does inequality mean uh, from a legal perspective for a state? As you are a constitutionalist and uh, uh, you study law, what does that imply from a legal perspective? Well, I have to say that uh, 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 my uh, 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 colleagues have provided uh, a lot of uh, food for thought. And this is a debate among us, uh, so maybe I will expand on also something else. What I have understood from what you said uh, is the following. If we focus on your questions, on the question, is it real development if inequalities increase, first of all, we need to uh, say to state if there is a, a development, we need to see that from an economic perspective. So uh, their answer uh, is perfect. I have been convinced uh, by their answers. Uh, they say that there can be no development for its own sake. You cannot just think about development and growth for their own sake. Development must always be seen from a social, moral, and political perspective. So as far as I've understood, they have said that there can be no development with inequalities, as in there can be no social, moral, political development if it is not accompanied by policies and strategies uh, uh, ensuring environmental sustainability, social sustainability, uh, fighting uh, poverty, distributing assets and richness, which have an impact on uh, uh, economic inequalities. This is what I have understood from your answers. Well, there may be development in some sectors at some time for some categories, but if all that is not accompanied by what I've just said and what you have said, then there's no development. Meaning moral, social, and cultural development. Clearly, there is some form of development. If there is a company which grows in size, then there is development. But that doesn't mean development. Development must be seen in a, from a comprehensive perspective. Then I thought about something else when uh, 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 Professor Fitoussi uh, was talking about democracy. In France, uh, you studied uh, uh, democracy quite a lot. Uh, there is uh, uh, one of your colleagues, Ranciere, who wrote a book about democracy. Uh, there are US, uh, uh, British uh, uh, writers, uh, uh, Proust uh, and Yasha Munk, uh, who uh, wrote about democracy. These politologists say that there is no democracy uh, in the uh, traditional meaning of the term as we Italians perceive democracy by reading the Constitution. Uh, to us, uh, democracy is what Norberto Bobbio uh, used to say. He used to say that democracy means justice, means equality. There is democracy when uh, there is all that. Crucer, Rancière, 
uh, who are not law experts, but uh, uh, have studied what has happened over the years, uh, say that democracy no longer exists. And uh, they bring about some examples. In order to define democracy, they say, the Europeans, uh, Italians, uh, uh, intellectuals uh, always need to add something, an adjective, like sometimes they call it representative democracy, some other times electoral democracy, liberal democracy, political democracy, social, digital democracy, uh, planet democracy, formal democracy, significant democracy. So the risk is that democracy no longer exists as such, as a concept. The concept that we have learned by reading the Constitution's Article 3. So this concept is not invented by sociologists or politologists. So they draw these conclusions just looking at what happens. They even say that there can be a democracy without rights and rights without democracy. And this is dangerous. So we need to take maybe a step back. Uh, we have uh, studied, all of us have studied our constitutions. And we need to go back to the concept uh, uh, of democracy given by the Constitution. So, let's look at, uh, for example, what has uh, uh, happened development in terms of development and inequalities. According to official statistics, uh, even before the pandemic, Italy ranked second in Europe as a country in terms of inequalities and income distribution. And the uh, generational gap, uh, the, the, sorry, the gap among generations is uh, uh, increasing to the detriment of the elderly. That means that uh, what the economists uh, call the uh, Gini's coefficient, uh, Gini's coefficient is the index uh, showing the differences uh, in uh, richness distribution. That coefficient has increased by 4% from 2019 to 2020. The new poor shifted from 31 to 35%. And the French, the Germans, the Italians agree on that. And uh, half of the income uh, today is owned by 10% of the families, whereas 90% of families uh, own the other, the remaining 50%. Uh, you said that there are people going to space, and they belong to that 10% of the population. Hence, the question we are being asked today, is it real development if inequalities increase? It means, that, well, the answer is that yes, no, there's no development. Now, from a constitutional perspective, I'm uh, a law expert, and I've always been dealing with the Constitution, studying the Constitutions, and I've asked myself one question. So we have uh, a Constitution. Its most important uh, article is Article 3, talking about equality, gender equality, and so on and so forth. So in the Italian Constitution, there's Article 3. It is very well written. The Germans, the French, everyone says that we are at the forefront in Italy from a cultural point of view in terms of equality. And I ask myself uh, uh, this question uh, uh, on uh, uh, democracy, development, and inequalities. And the question is the following. Calamandrei 
maybe some some of you know uh, who Calamandre is, and he used to say something. He used to say that uh, the Constitution, uh, uh, talking about justice uh, and equality, uh, talks about uh, great promises uh, penetrating in the hearts and broadening the hearts. But that was not the case. Canandre said something, and what is written in, in Article 3 uh, uh, of our Constitution today is not the case. It's not being implemented because facts show something different. And now the constitutionalists have a problem with that because uh, from this point of view, is the Constitution still vital? Maybe now there's a, a uh, the there is a crisis for the Constitution because it is no longer necessary. So, what has happened over the past 30 years? Let's forget about the uh, uh, 20 years after the war that were extraordinary years, but what happened then? Some uh, constitutional rules, uh, like those, for example, on the minimum salary, have never been implemented. And that was written in the Constitution. Basically, uh, we have seen uh, an increasing uh, uh, um, uh, number of rules, uh, decrees, uh, regulations, uh, and the tax system, uh, which is also enshrined uh, in the Constitution and should be uh, just, but it was not implemented. Uh, so uh, there have been uh, tax expenditure, tax, uh, uh, tax, uh, tax reforms, uh, deductions, uh, uh, all different reforms in the tax systems, uh, which in the end led to the flat tax. The flat tax uh, is uh, the opposite of progressive taxation, of increasing taxation. So our constitution uh, does not envisage the flat tax. Well, it does not, for, it does not actually forbid the flat tax, uh, but certainly the flat tax is not in principle in line with the constitution. Think about uh, uh, all the policies uh, uh, implemented in Italy, unlike France and Germany, uh, for public expenditure. Italy and our constitutional court uh, has been forced to identify the what we call the essential court. Let's say the constitutional court has saved the, uh, the tax reform by saying, well, yes, it is possible to uh, uh, enact rules on the public debt, but these rules must not change the essential core of the constitution. In my opinion, the consequences, the consequence is that uh, Italians have had uh, uh, to work on the Constitution's Article 81, for example, uh, which have led uh, to uh, the uh, principle of the sustainability of public debt. Marta Catabia. A cup, she was not a minister at the time, but two years ago, she said, she said, she said something. She said that uh, only through jurisprudence is it possible to ensure the coexistence, uh, the uh, uh, principle of the budget sustainability in Italy, much more than in France and Germany, we have such a large public debt that we need to study the relation between 
the rules that have been recently uh, been enacted with the principles of the constitutions. So we are now experiencing full globalization. This is the effect of uh, globalizing measures. We cannot be alone to uh, implement uh, uh, economic policies. We are also imposed policies by the European Union, as has often been the case. So to conclude, after what you said and after what I have said, I can draw a sad conclusion. That is that the real winner of the past 30 years in Italy has not been constitutional democracy enshrined in Article 3, 53, in Article 2, focusing on solidarity. That was not the winner. The promises to reduce inequalities have not been kept. The winner was the global financial capitalism that led to a vicious circle that might even reverse the, uh, 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 all the promises that were made. Uh, maybe this is a very sad conclusion, but this is what I think. Right now, in this, is, uh, this historical times, I think that we need to deal with these concerns uh, and uh, discuss about them. So, um, the situation is quite concerning. Yesterday, I facilitated a session with Minister Speranza, uh, Professor Chandra from the US, and Professor Ricciardi on uh, healthcare. Uh, where uh, in healthcare, if we don't invest in healthcare, uh, it means that we're going to worsen the life of citizens. Let's go for a second round of hope. Uh, let's call it this way. What are the possibilities? What, are there any uh, possibilities to reverse this trend? Samuele uh, uh, Rosa and Domenica Fanizza uh, um, have said that uh, uh, institutional organizations, uh, more than states, uh, are now focusing on these uh, uh, um, issues. So how is it possible to reverse this trend? This is the second question, first to the two economists and then uh, to the law expert. So what are the policies needed? First, we need to understand that the situation is as such because uh, uh, some special policies have been implemented by governments. The first policy leading to the financial crisis is the expansive monetary policy. So that the poorest, those who cannot benefit from growth, can consume. As there is a very low interest rate, loans can be taken. Hence, the financial crisis has been due to the crisis of the private debt, which has been so high that people were no longer able to repay their debts. And that led to the world crisis, as we've all seen it. So, this is, this is inequality. Let's try to uh, uh, find a remedy to this inequality uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, through finances, and that led to the crisis of the whole system. 
Second, we have believed that the, in Europe, the policy that could best avoid crisis was the austerity policy. We believe that the sustainability of public debt was the sustainability of the social and economic system, and we were completely wrong. So we implemented an austerity policy and also a competitive policy. The austerity policy increased the non-sustainability of the political, economic, and uh, social system. Because, as you all know, debt does not represent richness. It is just one of the uh, 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 elements to be taken into account. If to reduce public debt, the assets are destroyed. Uh, for example, the human capital is destroyed through unemployment. Or, or for example, uh, uh, the social capital. Or, for example, the natural capital, because no investments are made, uh, because there is no more money to invest. just because uh, we don't want to increase the debt, that will lead to poorer nations, poorer countries. So countries become so poor until, uh, the, until the competitive policies that lead to, for example, the reduction in salaries uh, throughout Europe. Hence, at the same time, uh, the system becomes uh, more unsustainable and inequalities increase. Uh, the reason why uh, we did all that uh, was that uh, we believed that our social system was too kind and too expensive. This morning, it was said uh, that the uh, uh, income um, uh, given by the Italian state uh, to uh, 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 the poorer people um, should be abolished because it prevents people from working. And if people do not work because they can get a free income, even if it's low by the state, it means that the salaries are too low. The problem is not to reduce this free income given by the state. The problem, the real problem, is to increase the salaries. So. that would lead to a decrease in inequalities. So there are two ways to reduce inequalities here. One, by implementing um, uh, social welfare to increase the social welfare, and uh, this is out of clear reasons. If you, when you go towards globalization, it's like you are opening doors and windows to everywhere. Uh, if you open doors and windows, uh, you need to protect people. 
If you don't protect uh, people uh, while you're opening doors and windows, uh, then uh, 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 people will suffer. and will suffer from democracy. The second way to decrease inequalities is to ask oneself, why should we reduce the salaries? Why is it impossible to think uh, uh, about an increase uh, in salary, just like an increase in productivity? What has happened so far is that uh, salaries increased less than productivity, and the difference between the two uh, has led to an increase in income. And the increase in income has created imbalances within the system. Also, uh, the system uh, has uh, become, so, t so to speak, uh, uh, explosive because income generates income. Now, the income has been multiplied by three at a time when uh, uh, salaries have not increased. Uh, multiplying by three means increasing by 300% compared to nothing. That shows that the system is no longer sustainable and will sooner or later explode. We don't know when, but sooner or later it will. And there's no other way out. If we don't protect social welfare, if we don't ensure social welfare and we don't increase the salaries, if we don't do that, it's going to be very bad in the end. The situation can only but worsen. Thank you. Stefano. Respond, Lord. Thank you. I will answer the question, so what to do? In order to fight against inequalities, we have two options. Either we redistribute or we pre-distribute. Well, redistribution measures are applied after the carrying out of the production process, for instance, Progressive taxation is a measure of this kind. Region transfers or transfers among social categories, bonuses of various kinds. Instead, pre-distribution policies try to have an effect before people enter the production process. The thing to be understood, but it's not that easy, is the fact that redistribution policies are not enough any longer. They are useful, but they are not enough, because over the last 40 years, inequalities have reached a certain level. Branko Milanovic said it in his book, and also others said it. So redistribution policies are not enough. The situation was different before. What are pre-distribution policies example? The most important one is education. Then it's about policies aiming at improving the skills of people in terms of uh, capabilities uh, as Amartya Sen defined them. And in particular, we need to consider the life condition as very important as well. But this is the object of pre-distribution policies. It is clear that 
in case of emergencies, you have to intervene on life conditions because if people are hungry, they are hungry today. So they can't wait two months to satisfy. They can't wait for two months to satisfy that need. But in Italy, this message doesn't go through. So everything is done only through redistribution policies. But why is it so? Well, there is an explanation. Redistribution policies can be made by the state so they can follow a vertical criterion that is quite centralized. Instead, the organized civil society is in charge of pre-distribution policies. Well, shall we call it third sector or you name it, but anyway, pre-distribution policies cannot just be implemented by public entities. So that's where the subsidiarity principle comes into play. Everybody talks about subsidiarity, but nobody tries to put it into practice. Well, of course, there are exceptions, but uh, I would somehow challenge anybody to say that this is not the case. But there is so much hypocrisy. I mean, everybody talks about subsidiarity, but nobody implements it. In other words, uh, the culture bearer entities of the civil society cannot put into practice. Let's take education. And here there's something I really always love to remind people. Adam Smith in the, in the Wealth of Nation, 1776, uh, wrote about education. Education and educational systems aim at developing in young people skills, dexterity, and judgment. These are the words used by Adam Smith. Skills means handcraft capabilities. Dexterity means being good at something, mastering something well. And judgment means the ability to judge and assess and to think at the end of the day. So the kind of education we need, writes Adam Smith in the full swing of the Industrial Revolution in the UK, is that these three dimensions need to go hand in hand. Let's have a look at what happened next, in Italy at least. So the skills were assigned to technical institutions. The austerity was assigned to professional schools and the judgment to traditional high schools. But we can't go on like that. Well, in the US, their system was changed some time ago. I don't know if you ever heard about flipped classrooms. Even if you're going to become a mechanic, you still need to develop uh, judgmental abilities. Why not? You don't need them. And another example of pre-distribution policy is uh, the change in work organization. But we are still dominated by the Taylor model. The Taylor model was made up by Taylor one century ago in 1911. But it was no third industrial revolution and not even the fourth industrial revolution. So our companies that are working in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution, machine learning, artificial intelligence, that still have a tailor-inspired work organization is a crime because this is what creates unemployed and inequalities because the tailor system was uh, invented to face the first and second industrial revolution. So times were completely different. So that is why it is necessary to change policies. Going back to a famous metaphor, redistribution policies are like transporting water in a bucket with a hole. Once you get to your destination, there is no more water. So you can increase progressive taxation, but then if people bring their capital into tax havens, well, what's the point? So redistribution, well, 
is made too late. So in a so-called closed economy, the one that was dominating before the globalization, well, that was somehow possible and feasible, but not any longer in a globalized world. And so pre-distribution policies somehow work on the trickle down. Trickle down means it's something, I mean, just trickles down, literally. Pope Francis, in the Evangelii Gaudium of 2014, wrote, trickle down is the most detrimental and wrong thesis that could ever be managed. After that, some economists said, oh, the Pope doesn't understand anything about uh, uh, you know, economic issues. And then, of course, it was them who did not understand about uh, economic theory, actually, because economics in one thing and economic theory is another thing. So you need to know your stuff to say some things. So actually, what is happening is the trickle up. So it's uh, the other way around. So in other words, those who are up are the beneficiaries of some economic effects. That's why we need to change perspective and change the structure of our systems. And Professor Gallin in a second will talk about this, but also in economic terms. So what's the message for companies? Stop with Taylorism, because Taylorism goes against your own interests and especially goes against uh, workers' interests. So those that really care for the educational system and Giorgio Vittadini as a president of the Subsidiarity Foundation knows this very well. I mean that we cannot go on like that. I think that maybe things are starting to change. So we are just uh, overcoming, uh, I hope, uh, very soon, uh, short-sighted policies because our society's destiny is really at stake. And uh, a very last word to Franco Gallo. So the same question for you, but uh, on the institutional and low level, what does this mean for I mean, uh, the low establishment. So maybe in the beginning I heard quite, uh, maybe I sounded quite pessimistic and aggressive, but I was trying to, to, to answer it to your first question. And now I'll try first to give a general answer. We need first to keep in mind that we all grew up respecting the basic principles of Christianity that are subsidiarity, solidarity, guaranteeing the common good. So if this is the case, we should uh, instinctively perceive the fact that when we go through difficult times, as times we are living in, we need uh, to leave behind all those contract, contractual theories that are so much self-referential when it comes to the market and the tools. So I'm not an economist, So, but this is what I got from what they said. So let's try to work on solidarity and equalities, and let's try to put aside uh, what is still emerging because there are people who still think that the traditional model that has been applied so far is the right one. So the primacy of the market over all the rest, uh, the existence of primary rights of the market, so on and so forth. And I think that we all agree, all three, on one thing. 
we should uh, give more room to the redistribution intervention of uh, public powers. What does this mean? This means that uh, public powers should uh, be strongly influenced by uh, more attitudes, uh, balancing uh, proprietary rights uh, with uh, the right to citizenship. It's not necessary to be Christian or having read Socrates that to know that in order to give life back some dignity, we need to think about the third subject, the public power that should take care for a fairer and better society. I would say that public power should anyway be limited. We need to have one, especially as a reaction to the pandemic crisis. Public governance, however, should be combined to what was mentioned beforehand, the so-called horizontal subsidiarity. The state of efficiency is not enough. The funds of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan is not enough. To me, it is crucial to go back to horizontal subsidiarity. I read the Caritas in Veritate encyclical letter by Benedict XVI, and he said that, well, uh, public power is crucial and is a redistribution oriented, but the encyclical letter said that private operators should also be there, organizing in communities, in uh, third sector associations. All these uh, entities can deal with the common good. Even together and within public powers. So the horizontal subsidiarity means uh, pursuing a specific goal. It means trying to guarantee all those uh, empowerment aimed uh, functions that the state cannot guarantee. So if this is the basic idea, we should on the one hand put into practice the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. And on the other hand, we should go back to voluntary work, uh, solidarity, social relations. So again, this is something that should be recovered. To sum up, much remains to be done. On the public level, Let's implement this recovery and resilience plan and see how these can be put into practice. Also hoping in a future more federal and more united Europe. So this is the perspective for public power. So the public power is a power that is not, I mean, 
centralized in a dominating way, not at all, but it is subsidiarity oriented. I hope that this will happen. I hope that the, uh, this government will be able to put all this into practice. I'm pretty hopeful. Well, we would really like uh, a more federal Europe, but so the idea would be to have some commonly shared power helping us and supporting us. So the impression that I had is that of a lecture, I, we really learned a lot. And I think that this is somehow the general sort of uh, teaching that we're getting from uh, this uh, uh, meeting. So in spite of uncertainty, we need to have the courage to find new ways. We need to recover words like uh, equality, right to health, education, and life. We have the courage to go beyond uh, a pessimistic view of divide between the rich and the poor. So it means having the courage to try to open up new horizons to live uh, public life in a new way. And uh, I thank my three guests because certainly they gave us new insights and uh, considering our life, uh, we need uh, new ways to look at the society and the economy because things have changed uh, and uh, it's important also to see to what extent these uh, key concepts have become important again. So we really hope that this meeting is going to contribute to, to this kind of uh, mindset change. And thank you to these three masters for their guidance. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.